Welcome to Design Talk 21. This design talk is about manufacturing with a focus on plant layout. Pictured here is a newly created plant layout for orchard cabinetry. If you watched my design talk about ready to assemble furniture, you'll recognize this company name and can probably guess that this design talk was inspired by that earlier talk. As I've mentioned in most of my design talks, I worked for many years in design and manufacturing for a glass store company. I had many roles while there and one in particular had me as part of the plant design and layout team. We used a simple 2D process that looked much like what is shown here. The original building drawings came from the architect and looked much like one would expect with walls, electrical, HVAC, fire systems and the like. Those drawings were converted to electronic CAD versions at one point in time and equipment and whatnot was added as the plant got developed. When I joined the team I brought it all over to TurboCAD where I then maintained the drawings and made changes as needed. Since I worked from a home office and the plant was thousands of miles away, I would often meet online with the facility manager and he would verbally direct me to where he wanted new equipment placed or how he wanted assembly line changes made. He didn't know how to use CAD, so this was what worked best for us. Other times, he would large format print the drawings and use paper cutouts to place equipment in new locations. He would then take pictures of that and send it over to me so I could make the changes. This worked okay, but I preferred the online meeting method as we worked well together and I could get clarification right away when needed. He was good for the ego too, as he was always amazed how fast I could manipulate the models. So you might think this is funny or strange, but I recently used the print and cutout method to show my mother how her furniture could be arranged prior to her moving into a new residence. This worked really well and helped her realize that the big change could be managed, and we could set her place up to look just like it did in the old one. As I mentioned, the RTA nightstand was the inspiration for this talk. As I produced all the models and visuals for that design talk, I thought about all the things required within the plant to make the manufacturing process work. In a nutshell, it's all about flow, as we'll see. As you might know, it's unlikely that a manufacturing company of any significant size would be making only one product, and if they are, I bet they will have multiple variations of that product. In the case of the fictitious company Orchard Cabinetry, they would be making more than the three variations of the Liberty Nightstand we saw in the RTA design talk. As that is the case, I gave some more thought to what other products they might produce. Would they focus tightly on a specific area of furnishings, like those for a bedroom? Or would they spread their creative wings and produce a wider variety of furnishings? Since Orchard Cabinetry is in essence a woodworking shop, I thought they could produce a wide variety of furnishings, provided that the tools could accommodate those other products. Over the next few slides I'll present some of the things I think we might see Orchard Cabinetry produce. Just before we move on to that, note the part images on the right. These are the RTA connectors I believe we need for the current on-screen product. It doesn't include other hardware such as drawer slides and pulls, but just the panel connecting parts. This is just a quick assessment as to what would actually be used since this could vary based on further research and development. How about this credenza? It's a design I came up with a few years ago and thought would make a great piece for one's home. I don't see anything in it that would make it less than an ideal candidate for RTA projection. This modern desk, based on one of my TurboCAD tutorials, is very straightforward and I believe it too would be an ideal candidate. I always like the overall look with its perforated metal screen between the pedestals. Some folks might not like the color scheme, but that's definitely something the design team could discuss and change before any production began, if that was desired. Here's a hope chest that I designed and built for each of my grandchildren. It's a simple design that I think looks great with bright colors. The padded top makes it an ideal bench for placement in the kids' room. It could also double as a toy box if that was a better choice for owners. As for connectors, I thought a more robust system could be used, such as the one shown here on the right. This seven drawer high boy chest is a bit different from what we've seen so far. It's more traditional, but I think it could be processed in such a way to work well as an RTA package. 
there's nothing to stop us from using multiple types of connectors, so I've shown a more robust one here for the case and the lighter one for the drawers. This is another product based on a TurboCAD tutorial I produced at one time. It's a face frame dresser and like the other items so far, I think it's a good candidate for RTA production. For this one I used a less than traditional finish that I think looks great. Something like this could be offered with any number of finishes and that number could be increased or pared down as future sales dictated. This kids table and chairs is based on one that Denise and I bought for our daughter Emma when she was a little tyke. It was a sweet little RTA unit and looked great with its child-friendly color scheme. Again, we could offer this in multiple colors. As I pondered the fact that orchard cabinetry is at its heart a cabinet shop, I wondered if we as a manufacturer of RTA furnishings might also consider producing and selling fully assembled products like this tea cabinet. We could even supply the kettle and the ceramic cups as part of the package. I think that it's small enough that even though it's not an RTA product, it would not overwhelm the plant while being built, boxed, inventoried, and prepped for shipping. As a side note, you might remember the commercial cabinet shop I've mentioned before. Things would slow down in the summer and I'd often say that we should produce and sell some products instead of always relying on winning bids for the large jobs we are hoping to land. Upper management just wouldn't budge on their set in stone ways and they always said something like, well, we can't compete with IKEA. I always thought that was narrow-minded and after all, who says we have to compete on that scale? In fact, I knew of another local cabinet shop that bid on all the same jobs we did, but they also produced furniture and sold it in a local furniture store they had in the retail area of our city. I saw that store stay in business for all the years I can remember, so it must have been bringing in some cash from sales. I'll have to drive by and see if it's still in business after all these years. In the same way, I thought we could produce this machinist chest as a fully assembled unit. Although its design is based on a traditional machinist chest, it can be scaled down or have its style tweaked to attract all kinds of buyers, even those in need of jewelry boxes. I've always loved the machinist chest and found a renewed interest in it when I saw a video tour of the Gerstner & Sons factory. It's a fairly small factory, but it has a lot of appeal. I just revisited their website and see that they're offering a do-it-yourself kit for one of their chests. It looks very much like an RTA product. So at this point we're going to move into TurboCAD for a deeper look at what needs to go on there while discussing plant layout. So here we are in TurboCAD. First off I want to mention that TurboCAD is an ideal software for this because of all its 2D and 3D capabilities as we'll see. It's even got architectural tools which helps with making walls, doors, windows, that type of thing. So we'll just kind of do a little bit of an orbit while still in wireframe here just to show you that we are indeed 3D modeled. So there's a few pros and cons to doing this in 2D as opposed to 3D or vice versa. So the benefits of 3D versus 2D, uh, one of the big ones is that you can get a really good overview or a feel for the three dimensions, width, length, and height. One of the cons is that it might take a little bit longer to model, but once you get used to the program and working in 3D, almost feels faster than it does 2D. And it's actually way more versatile in the end. Another con is that it's often easier to get 2D models from vendors who supply your equipment. We used to do that often with our vendors at the glass store company. They'd send us a 2D drawing and we'd pop it in there really, really easy. Nowadays it's getting more common to be able to get 3D models from vendors, so that's maybe not such a con as it used to be. So let's go ahead and go into draft visualize mode. So we'll select these settings, click OK, and we'll give it a moment or two to load. The initial load takes a little bit of time, depending on size of the model, but once it's loaded, you can zoom around in here pretty quick. So here we are in Visualize Draft. Now if I move around, you can see we can move really easy in here. Just like so. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was the building design itself. 
So often time when you're looking for a facility, you don't have much choice. If you need just a specific size, you might get what's available. That might have roof trusses that don't require columns throughout it, or it might be an older building that does use columns. I've placed columns in this one because it's similar to the one that the glass door company was in. So you have to be really cognizant about where all those columns were and work around them as best you could. In this case, I think we're going to go ahead and turn them off so they're not in our way as we're looking and viewing. But we'll leave the posts there or the columns. One of the things I wanted to mention before we get motoring too far in here is that TurboCAD is great with its functions to create layers or layer filters. So you can put all your various components on the layers they belong to, and then you can turn them on and off independently. Layer filters allows you to create a collection of those layers into different named filters, and then you can turn those off and on as needed. So here we've got some machinery down here. We've got them assigned to this unit here, and we can turn them off just like that. And you can also go ahead and turn on independently as well. So they work really great. So if you see this dot, dot, dot here, that means some are on, some are off. And then you can turn them all off or on, depending on the click. So one of the other things I wanted to talk about in general was square footage. So you really need a plant that's going to accommodate all your needs and actually give you a little bit of extra room for growth because that's surely going to happen over the years. At least that's the major hope. So this facility is just over 100,000 square feet. It's maybe pretty large compared to what they typically were, but nowadays from what I've read, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger all of the time. This is a 20 foot high working ceiling or a 24 foot high wall. I've read that some factories and distribution centers are going up as high as 35 feet working area. So while talking about square footage, I kind of wanted to show you the glass door place that I worked before. Now I'm not giving you any details about where it was located or even who it was. In fact, the company that was in that location now has moved across the country, so it's not even in the same place. But I thought it might be fun to look at a couple of images about it and talk about it just a teeny bit. So here's a Google map of the, of the place where it was. So the original building was right here. And we also utilized a little bit of this huge old manufacturing facility. I think the guy owned both places or eventually bought this one as well. So anyway, we started out here with part of the system and part over here. Then eventually he sold this unit off and we moved everything under this roof. And we rented a couple of spaces out to a couple of other places because we didn't need all this space. I think there was a metal manufacturing group in there and I forget who else. Anyway, I just wanted you to see that. This is the view from the sky. I'm not sure if you can see this very clearly, but all across this entire roof was solar panels. The owner was into energy conservation and all kinds of stuff like that, so he ensured that he did his part in all of that. So here's that original building. So that's this one here. This is just down on the corner, and this is from 2013, so this was a few years after I'd already joined this company. And this is what that place looked like. So it wasn't huge, but it was what we had at the time. So if we go now and we look at the old building, Google's kind of funny because I can take some of these old shots from 2013 and then there's a slider that can take you up to 2019, which was the last set of Google things. But it's kind of stupid because Google did this whole area back there, but in 2009 they didn't drive down this street. So you can't park here and have 2019. But you can go back a bit further to another street and go up to 2019 but I couldn't see a really good view of this. We'll go to the other corner and we'll talk about the same thing when we get there but there I could back up a few feet and get the new year and see the same view. Anyway I wanted to show this view because you can see this is quite a large place. This water tower was part of that original factory and we eventually took this down when we renovated this entire building. 
let's go to the next shot. So this is down at the other corner. So here you can see just how long this place is. It's just huge. I think the overall footprint was around 225,000 square feet. So this is before we went and renovated. And so the next is the same image where we've backed up just to this corner on this street. And here we are in 2019. So you can see all the new glass and all of that stuff. And because part of our business was creating insulating glass units, we had a, the ability to create all our own glass panels, and I think we did that for this. So all of this is produced by us on top of our day jobs, if, if you will. So I did take one image from inside. I don't think it gives any details away. Like I said, it's not there anymore and you can't really see anything that's trade secret type stuff. So one of my trips down there, I went and took pictures of everything because working from my home office, you know, you're away from everything and it doesn't always seem real. But when you go to the place and you take pictures and you look at everything, it just makes it so much more real to you as a freelance worker. I think these flags up here were who we did business with or got supplies from. He was pretty big into world community. He also did a good thing by doing a lot of hiring of veterans and giving them a place to work, stuff like that. This building, the original one, when he purchased it and started his business, he bought in a, what's it called, a depressed area of the U.S. so that you got all kinds of tax breaks. And so you hired people from the local area to help rebuild or revitalize. So, like I said, he was really a good guy. I really enjoyed working with him all those years. On a slightly more sour note, I should probably mention that the owner, the original owner, decided he needed to expand and he needed more money to do that. There was a huge market to be had, so about the same time he was thinking about selling, an investor group came and offered to buy his place. They were a group that was buying all kinds of businesses in this arena. So he decided what the heck he'd sell and he stayed on for a couple of years while they made the big transition. But I must say that although they made the business really start to grow, they had a whole different attitude towards things. For the investor group, it was basically all about money. So a lot of the good stuff that we had seen from the original owner got shuffled and lost along the way. It's pretty sad to watch, but that's how things go sometimes. So let's move back into Turbocad. So I just want to switch from visualize draft mode to visualize hidden line mode just to show you the difference. So it too can look pretty good and you can still scoot around in it pretty fast. The thing about using hidden line though is sometimes things get hidden from view. So if you're looking from the top here, I mean this is above these units, this is dust collection which is fine, you can still get an idea about it. But if you come over to say this office area, all the windows and doors are hidden, so you don't see them at all. So I like to keep things quite simple so that I can either work in draft rendering, like we saw there, or we can work in wireframe. So if you make something and you keep it relatively simple, it still looks okay in wireframe. You know, here's a typical door you might see on a 2D plan, same with these. Here you can see a few extra lines just because of that. But like I said, if you keep it simple, it's going to be just fine. So we're going to go back to ISO view, and then we're going to go back to visualize mode, draft rendering. Okay, so let's discuss some of the things that aren't here. And you can surely include them in separate drawings, in separate layers, all kinds of things, whatever works for you. So I didn't put HVAC in here. Uh, uh, drawings that come from the architect will likely have those, so you can include those, have them on a separate layer, and show those layers when you need to for whatever visuals you're creating for the team or drawings. I didn't put the fire sprinkler systems in here with hydrants or extinguishers or I didn't lay out fire escape routes, but I did ensure that I had a lot of fire exits in here. 
course regulations would specify where those go, but I just kind of winged it for this. I didn't show the airlines to the various locations. I did go ahead and show in here just a compressor so we could run lines off of that to show where they are. And I'm sure you would want to if this was an actual real facility and a real job you were working in. I didn't show plumbing, electrical, or lighting. I didn't show computer stations. And some equipment I didn't show, like the hot melt glue stuff that you'd need in these assembly lines. I didn't show some of the other stationary equipment or other types of equipment like loading dock ramps in here. Those are sure worth the cost to have them installed, so you could always illustrate them as part of this. Another thing I didn't show was signage. You saw the flags in that last image I showed, but in our plant of the glass door manufacturer, we had signage all over the place at all of the various stations to give visual cues and hints to all of the workers within there. So I made just one quick sign here just to show what they kind of looked like. So they were large poster size and they were hung wherever they needed to, showing what equipment was used, what consumables were used, and what we were expecting during the application. So pretty good thing to have and it works really well. So back to TurboCAD. So next I want to mention blocks and symbols. So blocks are the ability to create a specific item, doesn't matter what it is, any type of model or assembly and you can build it, add it to your blocks palette, and then any instance of that is basically the same all of the time. So if you need to edit one, you can edit your block and it'll change all instances of that. As for computing power, we've found over the years that blocks used within a model are a really good idea because even though you might have say 15 or 20 blocks of the same thing or even more the program kind of sees those as one instance only so somehow it reduces the power to calculate everything i mean you might still see it increase when you do a quality render or something like that but overall it doesn't seem to add a whole lot extra to what's required computer wise TurboCAD also has the abilities to use symbols, so they have libraries, symbols. So you can create the same thing and you can add it to the library. And the library, in essence, makes it available to any drawings in the future. So it doesn't have to be specific to this one. Where blocks are generally specific to the drawing you're working on. But there's nothing to say that you can't get advantage of blocks using symbols as well. So you just create your block first and save that block out as a symbol. So you bring that into the new drawing, you bring it in, and if you explode it once from its symbol format, you'll see the block that it is. So really quite a sweet system. So let's move on now to the general discussion of what we're going to do in this facility. We'll talk about all the various areas and what goes on there and we'll take it from there. So if we come around to the back here, we're going to look at receiving first. So we've got docks for our trailers to come in, and we also have a overhead door that's at ground level. That's a little bit more handy for when you're bringing in long dimensional lumber. Comes in on a flatbed, you take it off with your forklift and you can come directly in through this door here. So I don't have too much listed in the receiving area. It's kind of just a blank slate for now, but I'd figure out that as we went further along and discovered what other needs we require there. So the first thing that we do when product is coming in is we need to be able to tag it so we can track where it's going. So when I was with the glass door company, we used to use a lot of barcodes. Barcodes are fine because then each item has been handled tagged or marked and then scanned with a proper scanner to bring it into the inventory software. As I was researching this particular topic, I decided that smart tags, which I've heard a little bit about but have no experience with, might be something to look at. So I did a search here and first off I came up with this website here. It's just a little bit of a blog about it. So these smart tags, you can attach them to your product. I would do that as it came in off the truck and then when these things got sent to wherever they're going, 
they're set to be located electronically. So there's definitely pros and cons for these. The pros are is that you don't really have to scan them directly like you do barcodes after the fact. You can just fire up your software and it'll locate wherever they are without actually having to see them physically. The cons is basically the cost of them. They can be quite costly apparently and so your business model would determine whether you could afford that or not. So pretty sweet idea. So be sure to check that out if this is something you're going to be working toward. I saw another small blog or simple blog because I was wondering basically how this system works. I, I know it uses GPS of sorts and I'm thinking, well, how does that work in a small little factory? I can see it working on a big scale where if you mark a box and it heads out on a truck or and goes out to where it's going, you can do your GPS tracking to see where it, where the truck is and maybe even that box so you know it's delivered or, or whatnot. But according to this, it's very good system for warehouses too. So maybe it can be more narrowly focused to find things in a smaller footprint. I also saw here that you can attach a system to your forklift and that'll direct the driver to wherever these tags are within your warehouse to easily find them. So back to TurboCAD. So once we're in receiving and we've tagged everything, everything go to where it needs to go. So like I was showing just a little bit here, any of this dimensional lumber, hardwood or otherwise, can get set on these cantilever racks so it's right near where we're going to be working with it. Back here I've got plywood, so though it can also go in cantilever racks and will work very well. Now I didn't fill these all up because I didn't think there was a need, but you can see that I've marked the racks with an identifier. And I've also identified this particular unit as what product it is. Here you can see on the floor that I've marked the zones. So all that goes hand in hand with inventory control and, and the ability to find your stuff. Next is the first line we have here. We have pallet construction. So we'll pull the proper hardwood off of the racks and we'll start it out here. I've got two lines running because if it gets really busy that might be something we require. Dual lines means twice as much equipment but that's probably just part and parcel of doing the business of manufacturing. So once these make their way through here they can go into pallet storage which we have here. I've also made this so that I can have any returned pallets added to this area. So if this need needed to be wider or narrower, this could be adjusted as needs dictate. So next in this area is hardwood prep. So in, in our case, we need hardwood for some of the things. If you remember the nightstand talk, we were going to make the tops out of hardwood and the drawer fronts out of hardwood. So that's going to come in as dimensional lumber. So it's going to come in here and require some processes. So here's planing. Here we go with jointing. Here we come with some additional cutting. And then table glue up as needed. Maybe it needs to go back for a little bit more cutting. It can just kind of work its way around here. And then it's carded and sent off to the shaper so we can make our profiles on any of the things that need that. Again, if you remember the nightstand, we had a really nice profile around the sides and front of the top and around the drawer front. Then it's popped on a cart here. So here I just added an extra little note for us to cart and over to panel cut again if need be. I guess it depends on how you're going to make these particular units if it requires additional cutting afterwards, after the fact. I know some people when they make a product they make it a little bit longer and then trim it down after. That's probably not what we're going to do here. We're probably going to cut it to size so we reduce the steps required to get it finished. Anyway, so next is the panel prep or panel construction area. Again we're going to run two lines. So here we have panel saws and carts. 
A lot of the panels will require some edge banding, so we've got a couple of edge banders here that ends up back on the carts. Over here we have a couple of boring machines. So we've got two of those. The boring gets done back on carts. Here we've got some drum sanders to finish them off. And here we get that stuff all restacked on pallets. And then once it's palletized, we have our various forklifts and pallet jacks to come in there and move it off to the side for where it's going into additional processing. So just before we move out of that area, since this is a woodworking area, we do require dust collection. Here I've illustrated that with the ductwork, as well as a dust collecting system outside here. I've added some bins so that we know that we're going to need multiples. One when it's filling, we need to be able to move that out of the way and add some other ones under there prior to the truck coming to pick that up. So the next area that we're looking at here is what I'm calling area for growth. So we always do hope that our business grows. So I've left a little empty space here to accommodate that. Yeah, if you find that we need additional storage for a while, we can put some pallet racks in here and use those if need be. So as this stuff's coming off here, I'm having it parked in this location prior to what I'm calling painting, but that could be finishing of any type. So if we look at the finishing area or the painting area, I've got two rooms here and they're both completely walled off all the way to the roof so that they can remain as dust free as possible. Here we've got an overhead door to bring our stuff in and we can just park some pallets in here for now as we need them to come in and then we're going to run them through the paint booth. So they'll go through the paint booth, come off, get parked and moved maybe onto some carts here if they need drying carts. So one of the things I didn't show is any of the drying carts or tables if need be or tool chests or things like that. So as you lay out your floor plan you can add those things as well. I wanted just to point out this line here or this conveyor system. It's something I just kind of thought about and how it might look. It's a pretty simplified version here, but let's just hide this booth for a minute. Where's that thing up here to hide objects? There it is. So in here we can see that we're going to have several hundred of these racking things constructed and made for us. So they'll just be lined up here and we'll have somebody here start loading them. So I thought we could have a unit that looked something like this. So here this thing can move up and down as well as this move up and down. You just have a little uh, a hand thing that kind of looks like a thumb screw, but it's bigger to fit the hand. You can have these the same thing where they move in and out as need be. And then they just have it so that you can set the ends of your panels on here because they typically don't get any finish. So now you can get at either side of this quite well. And this thing up here is just some extra um, weights that can be shuffled in and out to help balance this. I don't know what that would really look like in reality, but I think something like this could work. So you get the idea of that. So once things are dried up a little bit and can sit on their own without getting any smudges or fingerprints or collecting extra dust, they can get sent out into this room here where they can be stacked and shelved. Again, just simple pallet racks with labels on top and again our zone labels. So you can see I have people doors and overhead doors in here and all of these would need to be sized accordingly to what you're making and producing. Alright, so once our panels and whatnot are completed and our hardware is all stored wherever it's stored. Everything needs to make its way to the assembly lines. And before we get there, I want to point out these cantilever racks and how they work. So as I said, 
product coming out of here can go storage on here, but it can go directly to your line as well. So on these racks, you have pallet racking above and then you have cantilever racks here. So if you have a lot of product, you can stack it up high. And what I would do in a case like this, if you remember the nightstand, you got about 25 parts. So you start laying them in here in order. What did we have? I don't remember. So you'd have the box cardboard to start and you'd glue it up a little bit and then you'd start going down your line, pulling each part as you needed, dragging it along your table, popping your parts in until you got to the end where you glued that unit up. So all your parts are in line here. Any extra storage is above as needed. That's why I don't have a whole lot of extra pallet egg racks elsewhere because so much of it can be stored right on these lines. So I've got 16 lines here. So if we look here, we've got assembly line one. This could be nightstand. Here we got assembly line two. This could be face frame dresser, whatever, whatever works. When we were talking about columns, Sometimes the columns, you just can't get, a work, get around them, so they're going to get in the way. In this case, we've just made accommodations by cutting away a chunk out of this table. And if you happen to be on this line, well, you might end up just having to pick up your box or wiggle it around here as best you can so that you can lay it down here. So if you're not using all your lines in this system, maybe just don't use these unless it's absolutely necessary. So as you can see, our flow is leading to each line. I didn't label them all, but you get the idea that I did one of each. As products are boxed, you could have pallets laying in these parking areas where you can just keep piling on until a pallet is full. Then you radio the forklift guy and he comes and picks it up and takes it to staging or whatever else place it needs to go. I also wanted to mention that if you have a product that's more high volume than some of the others. You could have more than one line dedicated to it without any trouble. If things changed over time, you can certainly redo your lines easily by moving the product out of one and putting it elsewhere and duplicating whatever needs to be done. I'm sure that makes sense. So once it's coming out of those as finished palleted products, it's going to come over here into staging to ship, so I'm not sure what that would look like. I know ours used to get quite cluttered, but you could organize it in such a way that you could paint lines on here so that you always knew what was what quite easily. Then of course it heads out on trucks for the most part, but we also have a ground level door here if need be. So we do have some additional areas we want to look at, so let's do that now. So we'll come down in this location here. I guess I could go to top view to make that a little bit easier, but what the heck, we like to have things complex, so let's go like this. So here we have a prototype and testing area. So we're going to want to be able to make new products. So this is an area where we could set up and build by hand and check how things fit. We could cut some cardboard to make boxes just to see what would work, all that type of thing. We also need to do testing. So when product is completed, we need to bring some of it back here and do some product testing. So we might need some machinery that puts some forces on that product, things like that, just to check out its structural integrity. These areas could be adjusted as needs dictate. Maybe you don't need very big for prototyping or vice versa. So again, I didn't put some of the product in here, like tables, workbenches, tool chests, and that type of thing. Next to that is the maintenance and mechanical. So this is a place for our facility manager and his team to build and repair equipment. So I don't know if we need a separate room from mechanical. Mechanical is going to be things like your air compressor, maybe some of your air vac systems, things like that. Maybe we need a wall in between here to keep the noise out of the maintenance area. Needs would have to dictate what that looks like. In all the years I was with the 
glass door manufacturer. I actually never did look in either of these two rooms, so I don't know what was there. Anyway, here you'd need some equipment, tables, workbench, tools, welder, drill press, all of that kind of stuff to help maintain the facility. When I was at the glass store company, we had a guy whose nickname was Buddy. He was so good. He um, would build everything we need. He'd build tables for assembly lines by welding them and whatnot. He was kind of a workaholic, too, because what he couldn't do here, he'd do at home on the weekends. But he was really good at it. We really loved him. As for doors and whatnot, I put a window on here so people could see whether or not he's working in there or he can see out in case people need him. And again, the overhead door, you'd adjust its size to accommodate what's got to come in here initially or maybe during a reno. Next to that is quality assurance. So like testing, we had stuff coming back over there to be tested that's been through the system. And in quality assurance, you're going to open up packages now and again to see how they look to make sure that your people are giving you what you want so you can be proud of what's going out the door out to your customers. All right, other things. Let's talk about maybe some other plant equipment we don't see here. So as I've mentioned before, we're going to have a forklift. I bet we can get away with just one unit in this whole factory. We'd keep that guy busy probably all day long, every day, without too much trouble. We'd have several pallet jacks, just like this one. This is an electric one. We could have some manual ones if we needed. They could be strategically placed in here, so some of these areas that require them more than others can have them handy. Remember we talked about the tagging. We could probably have a receiver on this forklift to help with that. One of the things I wanted to mention while we're looking at these pallet jacks and forklift is the radius that's required for turning. So on a typical plan like this, you want to have this circle that indicates its turning radius. So this way you can determine how wide your aisles need to be. So this might seem a little bit tight for, say, this forklift, but you're going to get a guy on there that knows how to drive that thing, is certified to do so, and can make it work in these, these areas. So I've made the typical width is about 14 feet, I think. So I've done the same in between all of these areas, so he can get in there and turn around if needs dictate. You could also get specialized forklifts that come in and they have the product coming off the side, so it's a little bit easier to, to stack into these various racks. Again, with the columns, you can see there's going to be a couple of places where it's going to be a little more challenging, so he'd have to come in from this side up to this point and this side up to this point. So that doesn't happen too often, but it is it is a thing that does. Now I know there's lots of equipment that could be shown in here that's not. There's just so many things that get used in a manufacturing plant and you should do your best to at least include all the big stuff. I had mentioned garbage bins before. We're probably going to recycle the sawdust. We should probably have some green bins out here for wood recycling, like cutoffs and whatnot. And of course, you've got typical regular garbage that we'll need bins for those as well. When I worked for the glass store company, we used so much aluminum, it was unreal. So we had bins that you could load on the back of huge trailers that were full of cutoffs from the aluminum. So that all went to recycling. So we're proud that we did that, that's for sure. So next, let's move up to some of the people areas. So up here, we can see that we have our washrooms for men and women, of course. We'll have enough space in here for quite a few cubicles, some urinals, some wheelchair accessible places. We've got some lockers in here, just so people can lock their stuff up if they need. Probably don't have enough for everybody, but that could be a earned bonus if you got some seniority. Here we've got some offices for the people out in the plant. So you got the plant manager's office. You might have an, area, an office for the guy who is the head of the painting. You might have an office for the guy in charge of cabinets or whatnot. You get the idea. And then here we've got an employee break room. Just going to go top view so it's a little more straight on for us. So here we have enough room for, I think, 32 places. We could tighten this up if we need to add a few more in here. 
Um, I was thinking about how many people would work in a facility like this, and I was thinking probably 50 to 70. So maybe you'd have to have people eat in shifts for lunch and whatnot. Anyway, with all of this stuff, a lot of it would be affected by building code, so it might vary in different places. One thing I think that is important to keep your people happy is a very nice employee break room. It could be painted up nice, could be kind of a good place to go. You'd want to make sure it was soundproof as best you can, so whoever's in there can kind of be really away from the plant. You might want to add a whole bunch of vending machines and things like that. One thing you might want to do is make a lunch counter here and have a lunch program. I know the place where my son-in-law works. It's a machine shop. They have a lunch program there. There's a gal that comes in for a couple hours every day and prepares the meal for lunch. I think they pay about $2 or two fifty a day. And if you got a really good manager, which we would have here at this facility, he'd take a bit of the company earnings and throw a bit of extra cash into that so whoever's prepping these meals can spend a little bit more on food and make some really nice stuff. So let's move on over to the other people's spaces, which is the offices over here. So the big cheese is the CEO, and he's going to have the biggest office. He'll have himself a little private washroom here, which I think is only fair. He's got a little hallway here with some closets. He can use that as well as, I guess, some of the other office people out front. He's got a little exit here, so he can go out into the plant really easy, or he can sneak in and out of the building really quickly through this exit here. So over in the other area here, we have some private offices. I really hate cubicle spaces in um, the glass door place where they have, I show this boardroom, they had cubicles for some of the salespeople and whatnot. And they had another bigger room back here that was an engineering room, so you had a few desks and a conference table. And gosh, that was a nightmare with so many people coming and going in and out of there. Anyway, no uh, cubicles in this facility. So over here we have some larger offices. So they're a bit wider, not quite as deep as these ones, um, but they are private nonetheless. These ones over here, they're a little bit narrower, a little bit longer, and they have a window. So that's basically how I chose to set these up. These guys got a bigger space in lieu of the window. I don't know which one I'd want. What about you? Here we also have the kitchen in a hallway. So that's an easy way to get out into the plant. Here we have a little kitchen set up with some sinks and a fridge and a stove. So workers in here could go ahead and set up for their lunch, take their lunch back to their office and eat there. What else have we got out here? So out here we have our welcome area and our reception. So visitors would come in here. They've got a little bathroom here if they need, or a washroom. Uh, there's a reception counter here. Our receptionist would work here, and she's got really easy access to the workroom, so she's going to do this job and this job. So I thought that would be handy, so she's never really out of earshot from reception. I think it's really important to have a nice receptionist. <laughs> We had a pretty good gal at the glass door place, but if I think back to my days when I was in that commercial cabinet shop, I don't know what they were thinking because the gal they had there was so nasty. I think she scared everyone away. I could never see the point in that. You'd sure want your place to be more welcoming than that place ever was. So if we scroll down here, we can go ahead and see that there's private washrooms for the office folks. So a few less stalls, but the same lockers and things like that. And another boardroom here. Both boardrooms have a lot of cabinets, so you can store office supplies in there or whatever else you need. And of course, you can pick which boardroom you need at any particular time. One of the things that was prominent at the glass door place was that the doors between the offices and the plant were key-coded so that only the office people could get in and out of there easily. They didn't want everyone back here coming in and out. And that's probably good because there's a lot of private corporate stuff going on in these main offices that you don't necessarily want your, your assembly staff looking at or knowing about. 
All right, let's just go up and have a look outside here. Just going to hide these dimensions so you can see a little bit easier out here. So out here we have parking. We've got wheelchair parking as required by law in most places. And um, this could be office staff and visitor parking. And then out back we have staff parking. We can adjust this as needs dictate. I forgot to put wheelchair parking out here, but maybe we don't need it here. Building code would tell us one way or the other. If we look here, it looks like I got that on the wrong layer. We've just got a little bit of a legend here with our rose compass, our compass rose. And here we're talking about motorways and parked palleting. That's just identifying our hatch over here. So I'm just going to flip back to top view. And at this point, we're just going to go look at some drawings I created. We can just look at those really quickly because we've discussed most stuff out here. But I think we need to look at the drawings and talk about what those are for. So here's sheet one. I've printed these on size D sheets so they can be large format printed and people can have a really good look at them. So it's a typical drawing with the title block and all of that jazz, just like you'd see on, on all drawings. These are always printed for the glass door company so that they could hang them up in the workrooms and whatnot as needed for discussions, things like that. That way nobody had to have access to CAD. And anyway, most people at the plant didn't know how to use CAD anyway, so this was the best route to go. So throughout this series, I'm using what's called viewports. So you can create viewports or model space. You place the viewport in here. You, you can adjust the scale and all that jazz. You can hide different layers in here so only certain ones show up, that type of thing. I should mention too that whenever you use viewports, if you make changes in model space, they'll be reflected in your viewports as well. So that's really good too. So I just made a few more drawings, just as I would have done at the glass door place, so we can focus on areas a little bit closer up than this. So we'll just flip through those real quick. So this one is for the paint and storage. So again, it's just a close up. And while you're in paper space, you can add all kinds of things in here, if that was your desire, because you can sketch in here. Most of the time you'd really want to do that in model space to capture everything further along. But if you had some incidentals you wanted to include just for this particular thing, then this is where you could do it. These viewports, as I mentioned, you can scale them to a scalable size, or like this. Um, you can have visible boxes around here. You can turn layers on and off as needed. If you pick a hidden line or a draft or quality rendering, you can check this box that says you only want it to render for printing. Usually that's what you want to do because if you have this rendered to quality render and every time you move in here or add something, it wants to keep up doing that. So that kind of doesn't work well. So typically you work in wireframe here and print out to your finished rendering. So the next sheet is the washrooms and the plant, the offices and the break room. We discussed all that pretty much before. Here we've got inventory storage up in this corner. Not too much extra to talk about there. Here assembly line, we're just showing one and two again. We just talked about all of that before. So nothing more to add at this point. Next sheet is the woodworking area, close up to that. Then we look at receiving. Next is the pallet storage area and the prototyping and testing area. We discussed all this stuff as well. Here's maintenance. Here's quality assurance. We looked at that as well. And then here we are looking at the staging and the shipping area. And finally, I have one for offices. Viewports you can rotate so you can have a better view so it fits the sheet better. So that's what I did here. I rotated this view. So let's go ahead and pop back to model space, just like so. So that's plant layout in a nutshell. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that will give you some things to think about while designing and modeling your own products. If you'd like to see some TurboCAD tips for free, visit Don Check's TurboCAD tips page. If you're interested in delving deeper into TurboCAD learning, be sure to check out the full project tutorials on my Textual Creations shopping page. See you next time.